Oh, nice. Okay. So it's working, right, Tyler? We got it. It should be working. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Right now. I, I am I have never done this myself. Tyler has always been like the master of ceremonies with all of this and tech and everything. So I'm a total Luddite. So you're gonna have to forgive me. I, I literally had to drag an Ethernet cord from my just to make sure that we had enough um, internet capacity. It's it's across my lawn into this computer in my studio. So um, anything can go wrong. So this might be one of those things where all it is is just a big bleeding cool article waiting to happen, but hopefully not. Um, so give people a few more minutes to, to join up. Um, maybe I can take a couple questions. If you guys have any questions really quick before we start, anything at all, just to kill time while we wait for um, a few more people to drop in. Uh, Tyler, are you seeing anything? Does anyone have a raised hand? Uh, not yet. I'll make sure to keep track. There we go. Stuff. I got it. Raised hand, five, six. Yep, okay. Oh, I'm, I'm in charge now. Look at this. Here we go. Okay. Raised hand. Let me see. Q and A. Oh, how was my Halloween? It, thank you, Todd. My my Halloween was great. I took the kids uh, trick or treating in this neighborhood, and Quinny, who was two, is at the age where like the laws of reality had like just begun to make sense to him. And then all of a sudden, there's like a seven foot duck or anthropomorphic turtle like coming at him, and it like shatters everything. And so to see that whole existential crisis and is really funny, not to be a total dick of a dad, but it's pretty hilarious. It's like when I worked at Disney World and it's like little kids who just started making sense of the world suddenly see like a giant chipmunk, you know, coming at them like this and it freaks them out. Um, but that's life, right? So it was great. He, uh, he was uh, a dinosaur and Babe Ruth. And my other kid who's 14 years old was too cool for school as he was an x-ray and he was just like a skeleton sheet. And uh, my 10 year old was Aaron Judge because he's obsessed with the Yankees. Um, so it was fun. It was a good time. My wife and I, this is the first year we didn't really dress up just because it was just juggling all those kids. So um, it was good. It was really good. It's my favorite holiday of the whole year. I, I miss it already. Uh, I like literally that uh, Nightmare Before Christmas uh, gif where it's like, you know, the wolf man when they're like 365 days till the next Halloween. And he's like 364. <laughs> That's how I feel all the time. Horror is my thing. Halloween is my thing. I love it. So yes, thank you. Anything else? Just to give a couple people a couple minutes. Let me see Q&A 14. I like Jason's oh. question. What do you value most in an editor? What do I, that's a good question. What do I value most in an editor? Man, you know what I value? I, uh, to be totally honest, like I value their ability to, 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 to join me on what the story is about and not be afraid to give me really good criticism or anybody good criticism in service of the story. So I really look for people that um, understand when I'm expressing like what my story or our story is passionate about and this is what it's going for and then will say to me then you should pick up the pace or then you should um adjust this character arc or then that i love honesty like honesty 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 my one of the first editors i ever got to hire on my own was um a great guy in comics and now uh, manga david brothers and he he was one of my first really vocal critics online about how i had certain ticks in my writing that i i did over and over again and I approached him and I was like, thank you for saying that. And um, then when he worked at Image and I went over there, I asked if he could edit our books. I knew he would always be straight up and, and honest with us. So I value, value that a lot in an editor. Um, and, you know, I, I like to keep them around and become friends with them over, over time. What else? Really quick. We'll give two more minutes and at 9.05, we'll start for real. I'm How about on, uh, what's the best Dracula movie or maybe best Dracula performance? Well, Near Dark Dracula. is my favorite vampire movie of all time, followed by like Let the Right One In and uh, and uh, uh, what should we call it? Um, yeah, I mean Near Dark is so far, but Lost Boys also I adore. Um, I love the original Dracula with with Bela Lugosi, but I also love Salem's Lot. That caught me as a kid. Those Stephen King movies in the '80s and TV shows in the '80s, like the adaptations, just just you know just affected me so deeply um here how do i let me check a couple of these um what's it like to champion someone and see them have great success it's fucking amazing i mean like seeing 
James Tynan, for example, who's one of my oldest friends. I mean, he was a student of mine when he was in college as an undergraduate. And I was like an adjunct teacher in my 20s, you know what I mean? Not knowing what I was doing. Seeing him become such a powerhouse of a writer and such a great person in the community is just, um, it's inspiring. You know, when your students become your teachers, there's no greater feeling than that ever. It's one of the reasons I love doing this. I mean, I have no business doing this anymore with the amount of work I have, but it really, I feel it keeps me young as a writer because I feel I have to be sincere about the things I teach you or I'm a hypocrite if I go back and I say, hey, you should do this, this, and this and follow these, you know, this compass when it comes to what you're passionate about. And then if I don't go back and apply those things, you know, what kind of a writer am I? So it's, it's kind of a, there's a selfish component to that too. And then seeing writers that you've had the, the you know, benefit of working with in any capacity just take off has been a joy. So, and now there's so many, and I, again, like I owe them a lot more than they owe me, but like Phil Kennedy Johnson and Mike Morisi and Matt Rosenberg and Joel Jones and Vita Ayala and, you know, up and down. There's just so many, Amy Chu and Marguerite Bennett. And I mean, so many people I've gotten to work with over the years that um, I'm so proud to be associated with in any capacity. And again, like I probably learn a lot more from their writing than they do from me, but it really is something that it's a great, it's a great, great joy. You know, it's the, one of the best feelings. So maybe one more and then I'll jump into our lesson. I'll just pick one at random. So many questions now. Um, uh, Scott, in I'm just picking, I, I don't know this, I've not read this one yet. It's from Justin Hawkins. Scott, in terms of characterization, have you ever found yourself surprised by the growth of some of your characters from where they, you started? In other words, did you learn something about the character once um, you really think about how they might handle a situation? Yes, uh, I was literally, I'm gonna close this now. I was just dealing with this and we're doing a writer's room for um, the witches TV show. And um, literally one of the characters, a friend of sailors that I had this whole arc planned for, as I was writing her out, it just became clear it's not what she would do. And it was one of the like thrilling moments of that process was being like, you know, I love those discoveries and the best storytelling to me happens in those moments where I know the beginning of a story, I know the middle, like basically, and I know the ending definitely. And then somewhere in the middle, a lot of the time is where the characters begin to grow and change things a bit. And sometimes it changes a lot of things, um, usually not the ending because it's important to me to know what it's about, but there's a lot of, um, a lot of things that can kind of change the nature of the story in different ways in the middle that come from that kind of character growth. So anyway, um, all right. Well, I'm so, so grateful for you guys doing this. Um, I really, I had such a blast last class with um, Donnie Cates. I'm really grateful to him for uh, stopping by. Uh, you know, he's a megawatt comic book writing star and has a million great projects on his plate and making time for class was, um, was really sweet of him. Um, and I thought he had so many great insights and being so open and vulnerable and honest about his experience and his whole journey as a writer was really, I mean, thrilling to listen to. Um, but the only downside of it was, I feel like we didn't get to some of the examples I wanted to show you. We, we might not have gotten in as deep with, with characterization and a, uh, and a tactile, like on the page way as, as I would have liked. So I figured we'd do a few examples tonight, not too long, but just so I can kind of complete the thought of what I was, what I was getting at. Because the thing I was trying to say to you guys is this, like characterization for me was something that I got wrong for a long period of time for two reasons, I think. And both of them had to do with kind of bad advice, you know, that I got over the years, both from um, teachers and books. And now you, you see it everywhere. Whenever I look up characterization, I see like 90% of things that I'm like, I wouldn't begin it that way. Um, and maybe I'm wrong, but um, that's always a possibility. <laughs> But uh, my belief is that uh, there's, there's a lot of kind of, um, there's a lot of sort of uh, advice that, that looks at things from a, a, a commercial point of view or looks at things from a point of view that's really academic as opposed to emotional, psychological, from a storytelling sensibility. A lot of what I'm gonna try and do in this class or trying to do in this class is let you sort of, or, or push you to think as a writer. And as a writer, I believe you inhabit the world of, of, of story, how best to tell your story. 
It's about you and your relationship to this one tale you are trying to, 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 to get across and express to people because there's something in it that matters to you. And with that as the compass, again, with that voice element, like when we talk about voice as the North Star, it rearranges a lot of the priorities that you bring to something like characterization. So what I was trying to say is, I think a lot of the advice that I got over the years was it's very, very important to know who your character is. And that is true, right? So if you're writing Batman, you need to know that Batman is a character who takes, or at least my version of him, you know, takes uh, every sort of downfall in his life and turns it into fuel um, to make sure that the kinds of things that happen to him won't happen again to someone else. Um, and he's just, he never quits. And that's who he is, right? Superman is a character that takes inspiration from the best of us um, and is our biggest fan and is somebody who, who, who is both aspirational to us but would never think of himself that way and that's who he is, right? Skinner Sweet or a character that you make up and you're not, when you're not dealing with licensed characters. He's a character that never met a fence that he didn't want to bust through. That's his whole goal in life is to find fences to destroy. Um, so it is, it's crucial that you know your character. That's not bad advice. But that's not good advice for how to start your story. And usually what you find when it comes to how to introduce your character in the story, um, what I find constantly are these bits of advice that are like, well, make sure you make a memorable entrance, or it's good to start in the middle of action, or it's really good to start uh, with a great line from your character. And none of that's like a bad thing to do, but it's not really important in my opinion. Like what's important is, is, is this. So it's about figuring out not who your character is, but where your character is in, in their emotional journey, where they are on their arc, okay? Again, we're gonna do character arcs in a month. Chip Zdarsky is gonna come by for a bit and talk about Wilson Fisk, talk about some of the character arcs that he's built so beautifully on his books, um, which will be a big thrill. We'll I'll talk about some of the ones I've done, but I'll give you kind of a bigger picture of how to construct an arc. But for the purposes of this class, what you need to know is simply that an arc is the quest and it's the journey your character goes on emotionally. Um, it's the conflict they face given the thing you're trying to put them up against. So in you know Iron Man, uh, the movie, like Iron Man's emotional journey is from going from being an egotistical prick to being someone who's a self-sacrificing -sac self hero, right? That's the emotional journey. And he starts at the beginning and he ends up here. Um, and that's, that's all deliberate. It's an origin story. Other times when you start a story, you might begin your character halfway through the arc and then recap and, you know, begin again in a certain way. But the point I'm trying to make is where they are um, in their sort of uh, trajectory, given the conflict you're putting them up against is to me the key thing, right? It's because Batman is Batman no matter what, but where Batman is in relationship to the threat you're, you're gonna make him face, that's what energizes a story. When you come into Dark Knight Returns and you see Bruce Wayne retired and down on his, you know, feeling almost suicidal and looking to get killed by the mutants, that's where he's beginning. That's not Batman as you've seen him, that's Batman at a certain place emotionally that, you know, begins a whole incredible story. Similarly, at the other end of the, at the other end of the, um, you know, spectrum, um, a book like, you know, Grant Morrison's Batman and Robin, where those characters start emotionally, Dick Grayson and, and um, Damien, it is, it has nothing to do with who Batman is or who Robin is. It's who these characters are at that moment, given the fact they've never faced these things before in that way. And the, the beginning of that book beautifully demonstrates the new energy of, of that team. So all of it is about where your character, your protagonist is in their trajectory um, given the conflict that you're going to put them against, okay? The second thing, and we'll get to this a little bit, I hope, is the how. It's how your character relates, okay, to the story you're trying to tell. And that's more a matter of craft. It's how you are going to kind of place, the, how, it's the decisions that you're going to make when it comes to narration, when it comes to uh, the pacing, when it comes to doing a cold open. It's where you, how your character relates to um, the kind of the type of story you're trying, the story itself that you're trying to tell. So uh, for example, you might be trying to tell a story where you really want the reader to relate to this protagonist and go through all these experiences with them in an incredibly intimate way where they're just glued to them. Then you might use first person narration and you might start at a point where it's confessional 
in that way. And that's the kind of how you get to the where, you know, the who again is just sort of the, the big abstract thing that doesn't really matter. And if I said to you, knowing, you know who your character is and then start with a great line of dialogue, that doesn't really get you anywhere or start with a memorable scene. It's memorable, but it doesn't matter. I could start with a memorable scene in Court of Owls of Batman, you know, defeating Riddler and you might like that scene, but it wouldn't have any relevance to the story I'm trying to tell, okay? So let's look at a couple examples and I'll show you both from my work and other people's work, what I'm talking about when it's about placing a character at the beginning of their emotional arc, okay? Um, here, I'm gonna share my screen. Here we go. Okay. What are you guys, what are you seeing right now, Tyler? I'm seeing a bunch of zebras and giraffes on the side of it, but yeah, I'm seeing comicsology. Are you, okay, I'm not sharing the right thing, of course, here. That's just my back thing, here, new share. Here, there we go. How's this, better? Great. Those, by the way, so you know why they're the, all those weird animal things are there? They're there because my two-year-old loves dearly getting printer shots of things from, um, he, like I'll print out things for him and he calls it his work. So he runs over there and gets his work and it's like a zebra or a giraffe on the color printer. And that's like, makes his whole day. So let me show you, I brought, I brought a few things. I'll start with something of my own just to, to kind of ease us in, all right? So this is the beginning of American Vampire and it's mostly to show you like I practice what I preach. So if you haven't read it, American Vampire is about a new species of vampire that's born in the old west and it, and it sort of, um, it uh, can walk by daylight and it has different powers and it follows that genealogy through the, the whole 20th century. Um, but none of that matters because this arc is about a character named Pearl. This is the beginning of the whole series, right? And she is a young actress in Hollywood and she's there for very particular reasons. And um, her journey is about going from being someone who came there wanting to be part of something that mattered, not to be a star, but to be someone who was in a film that moved people and inspired them to be better than they thought they could be. And that's what, what made her want to come out there. And then she runs up against this entrenched systemic um, resistance from vampires that run the film industry, European vampires. And she has to kind of decide what to do and she gets powers and she becomes a, the second American vampire and, and, and joins the first and, and takes all of them down. And all that's for later. But so here's how I started this. And by the way, just so you understand, I was like, terrified, terrified, terrified doing this. Um, it's my first big comic book and I was writing it with Stephen King, which was a total fluke. And I was convinced that everybody was gonna give up on it the minute Stephen King dropped the book. And he was also gonna outright me as he I'm sure did by a hundred times and I would be humiliated. But so here's how I start, right? So July, uh, 1925, 30 miles east of Los Angeles. I'm not gonna read you the whole thing, but the narration is it's first person. It's not narration actually, it's dialogue, okay? So and I'll tell you why when we get more, I'll talk about the how in a second, but where we are is this. She's talking about, I was eight years old the first time I saw a moving picture. It was my birthday and my father took me to, uh, I, to Topeka for the afternoon. And she tells the story about how they went to this candy, um, this candy counter and she wandered into the back and in the back, they were having this screening of um, the old French film, uh, you know, The Man in the Moon about the rocket ship, to, or rocket, what's it, trip to the moon and how it inspired her, right? And as I'm saying this, you're seeing this car drive out to the middle of nowhere and all these dead women are in the back of the car. Somebody mysterious throws them into a pit and then here's Pearl saying, please, I'm still alive. I'm still alive. But what she's talking about here and the thing to know, right? Is he's, she's talking about how inspired she was, right? Because I couldn't look away from the film because the rocket, it was off, it was flying, it was going higher and higher all the way to the moon, right? And there's the moon, turn the page and now we're on a movie set with the moon. And I guess that was the beginning of the end says Pearl, this is three days ago now, right? Oh, come on, that old trip to the moon short. And she says, what? It's beautiful and funny and sad. It's a classic Hattie. And Hattie, her best friend is like boring. And she's like, okay, Mr. Mill, what was your first movie? Uh, for and uh, and uh, she's like first ever Romeo and Juliet, and it's clear that Hattie is somebody from from Go that just wants to be a big star. And here comes the big director, and he's like, "All right, everybody, to your places." Here comes the movie star, who's way too good for all of them, and they make a joke about how he's too handsome. 
And then they say, um, all right, everybody look scared. And she says, terror, um, take nine. All right, tell me something scary, won't you? And she says, the rent's due tomorrow. And they scream. And that's the end of the scene, okay? So for me, what I'm trying to say to you is this. Let me stop sharing for a second, okay? The idea is that that scene, where she is in her arc, Pearl, she's at a place where she's hopeful. She's in Hollywood all because she wants to be part of something bigger than herself. And she's expressing that the moment you meet her, okay? It's on the nose because I only had five issues less than that. I had half, you know, because Steve Stephen King had, um, you know, a bunch of pages and I had a bunch of pages and they weren't totally double sized. So it was very, it had to be very economical, but that scene and in, you know, it has that um, on the nose quality, but it's about her saying, the first film I ever saw was this and it made me want to be part of something beautiful and bigger than me. And Hattie is different. That's where Hattie is. And she, all of that comes into play later in their conflict and so on. But that's where she is, is the key. Do you see what I mean? I'm starting her at the beginning of the arc. That's the scene. That's why I think it works. Um, the how of the scene is this. It's a story where I want you to be mystified with her as to what's happening to her. I don't want you to feel comforted, for example, by the fact that she is understands where the story is going in some way. So the choice is to do something that I call, I think this, maybe it's a term, maybe it's not, but a refractive narration. For me, if a refractive narration, and um, this is actually at the beginning of um, a couple of things that we could look at, um, but uh, that I loaded up, but I probably won't have time for, is when somebody's talking and, or doing a conversation or doing a narration that doesn't exactly apply to the things you're watching. And so there's a dissonance between what you're seeing and what you're hearing. And the, the meaning of that scene kind of is generated by the contrast in those things. And it exists almost out of that space. So her talking about the beauty of movies in Hollywood, seeing this horrific scene, the sort of mystery of how we came to this from that, the, is generated from that distance, from that chasm between narration or refractive narration and what you're seeing. Because it's not just somebody, it's a character speaking to you directly that you're going to meet in a minute, saying things that don't necessarily line up with what you're watching, okay? Um, and again, first person narration doesn't have to line up exactly, but that kind of chasm where they're not addressing what you're seeing at all is that is what I mean is refractive. There's absolutely nothing to do except thematically with the two things you're seeing that could run like that parallel. So the reason I chose that how to put her in there to have her talk that way was because I wanted you to feel bewildered and horrified and unsettled by what Hollywood really is in this scene and, and what vampires are, all this stuff. Okay, so that's the how. It's the where and the how, not the who. The who comes before and you get it and you know it and that's that. But it's, it's where they are in their emotional trajectory for this story, okay? For example, I'm not gonna show it again because I showed everybody in the class, in the class in earnest knows this, but I showed Court of Owls before for other reasons, for openings and that stuff. But Court of Owls is a story that's, if you haven't read it, it's about Batman being very confident about his knowledge and familiarity with Gotham. This is water, just so you can see, I'm not like drinking on the job. Um, but uh, the, um, the, uh, it's about Batman feeling very confident in his knowledge of Gotham and his position in Gotham and feeling great about being Batman and feeling like he knows it inside and out. And then all of a sudden this organization starts to emerge that is legendary and he always thought was a myth that is called the Court of Owls that existed for four or 500 years before Batman and will exist long after him and has influenced Gotham's history in all kinds of ways that he didn't think were true. And so I've talked about the construction of that story when it comes to three-act structure and arcs and all of that, and I'll do it again when we get to character arcs. But for the purposes of this, what I'm trying to say is where Batman is in that arc, everything I decided about the opening scene was how to make sure you as a reader feel Batman is so overly confident, it's fun. It's like the Batman always wins Batman. Do you know what I mean? It's that Batman. So I put him in a scene where all of a sudden he's, he's narrating to you, uh, well, I'll get to the how in a second, but he's in a scene, the scene that he's in, he's all of Arkham just got released and he's standing there about to face everybody and he smiles. And to me, that was all you needed to know where Batman was emotionally at that moment, right? He's characterization of him says to you, 
man, he's badass. Man, he knows what he's doing. And then how is he not scared? It's all his villains. Even one of them causes can cause a big, you know, a huge, uh, a huge challenge for him, but not here. And um, then not only that, but like he he takes them all down and, and then Joker attacks him and he winds up fighting alongside Joker. And you're like, how is this? Everything is confidence. The whole first scene, everything about characters. The next scene is all confidence. Everything's confidence. So that's where he is in his arc. And I needed to do that. Doesn't matter who Batman is. It matters where he is at that moment. I could have started it many ways. I could have started with Batman down and out and locked in a labyrinth and but that wouldn't have made sense for that story. I want you to emotionally connect to him. So the how in that story is I decided to do a first person narration where he's holding your hand and he feels, because what it does is it makes you feel like, man, this is awesome. I'm Batman just like him because he's telling you all about the history of Gotham and this column he loved as a kid called Gotham is, which again, thematically is what the whole story is about. He thinks he knows Gotham better than anybody. It is Batman in his mind, even though he doesn't admit it at that time. Um, that, that whole sequence is, the, the how of that sequence is him talking to you and not even addressing necessarily, except kind of in a funny offhand way, the villains he's facing. He's that great at this that he doesn't even need to worry about it. So that's the how, and that's the, the where, and that's the how. Do you see what I mean? So it's almost like where he is in the thing and then deciding how best to illustrate that given how he relates to the story, what kind of story I'm trying to tell. If I'm trying to tell a story that's unsettling, I wouldn't use first person narration because it's handholdy, unless it's one that's unsettling in, it, in its own nature. It's an unreliable narrator. It's somebody who's freaking you out when they start talking. So all of it is that, okay? It's thinking about where your character is and how they relate to the story you want to tell. Okay, so let's look at a couple examples that aren't mine. First of all, you know what? I'll show you for, I want to show you how this cross, this, like I love making the class interdisciplinary. I'm sure I'm going to screw this up somehow, but like looking at things like um, screenplays, we've done this before in class, looking at things like um, film, looking at things like novels, all of it. I love it. I'm going to bring in a play, I think in two months. Um, but I want to show how my goal is to kind of, my goal is to teach you the mechanisms and, and um, sort of tools of storytelling that, that really, that are, I feel are deep enough that they cut across all kinds of different Western formats. Um, so that when I learn how to, if I'm called on or someone says, hey, you want a chance to write something for TV of your stuff, I feel confident enough in my storytelling priorities that I can adapt to the format relatively quickly. That's what I really believe. If you learn the formats, it's really shitty. Like if you learn how to write a great screenplay, that's, I have so many friends in Hollywood and that stuff. I have a lot of friends in Hollywood that like, that's not to throw them under a bus, but I, you know, that's like the way they learned or how to write a comic. And I know plenty of comic writers that it's like, that's the thing. Or they editors tell them, this is what a comic needs. It needs this much action and this much that. And if you don't have your storytelling priorities right, like you don't know how to start with something you care about, how to start with what your story is about, what, what it means to you, even if that thing is just like a beautiful fantasy world that matters to you because it embodies things that you wish were real, you're not going to, you're going to fall apart in the world of professional writing in that way because you get dinged by so many fucking meteors coming at you from editors and fans and editorial changes that just happen and guess what you can't do that this way you have to do it this way because it's five episodes of tv and not 10 ep and everything you have to have a strong compass strong mind about what your thing is about so that's what i'm trying to do let's say start here and then use that as a priority to then like channel that into all the other kind of tributaries of of of, of craft so for me again I know what my story is about, you know, I figure it out. And then I say, well, how do I now, I know where, where my character is in their arc. And then how do I best apply all these different crafts elements to that, okay? But like, let, let's just like, I'll show you a comic and then I'm gonna show you one of the best, I think, characterizations ever, like in the history of storytelling. All right, let's look at God Country because we were going to look at it and it's one of my absolute favorite indie books of um, the last few years. I love this book here. I'm sharing the right thing, right? You can see it? Yep. 
Great. Awesome. Thank you. Tyler is the best. Everybody here, you should know and love Tyler if you're ever taking this class. And again, what I'm hoping is that some people are taking a look at this um, that are in the free subscriber section. You enjoy it. You want to join, join for a month. You hate it. You can leave, whatever. Um, but uh, I really like doing it. So anyway, so God Country. Okay. God Country starts with a bit of a cosmic, um, a bit of a cosmic tease. So it starts with this. This spread, which is beautiful, and Jeff Shaw is amazing. This year's story has been passed down in my family for generations now. Mostly true, far as I can say. Wasn't, uh, wasn't there for none of it, though, so don't make me swear on it or nothing. I'll tell it the best I can remember, the way it was told to me. It goes like this, right? And then it stops, the narration. So here's the intro. Here's characterization, right? That's part of the how, and here's where, okay? So Roy... The main character here, this is Roy here, um, okay? It starts here. A long time ago out in West Texas, there was this storm, okay? And I won't read you the whole thing, but what's happening is Roy and his wife and child have come to his father, Emmett's house, because there's been a disturbance, right? And he meets with the sheriff and he's like, hi, sheriff, I'm so sorry. I came as soon as we could. We picked her up from school. And, I, and he's like, he's like, Roy, your father, he's, your father is fine, Roy. He's like, nice to see you, Janie. And he's being pleasant and all of that. And he's like... Look, you want to head inside and talk about this? And he's like, has he hurt any hurt anyone? And he's like, oh well, look, Roy, why don't we go inside and talk? So you know something's bad from the minute Donnie hooks you, right? But Roy, where he's starting from, is this place of he knows his father's in trouble. He knows that his father does these things. Clearly, as you get through this page, you realize the wife. Um, I think it's uh, 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 Janie is like. Uh, I said, okay, Roy, she's just out there. She, she doesn't want to have anything to do with the dad anymore. She's been burned by this guy enough. Whatever problems he's going through, Emmett, the father, it's hurt their family a lot. But Roy keeps hanging on, right? And the sheriff is like, this was a bad one. They found Emmett out on the highway. <clears throat> and he's like, he's not supposed to be able to be that far. He's like, I know. Uh, I don't know how he did it either. But listen, you need to th think about getting him somewhere. This isn't getting any, getting any better, right? And he's like, He's like, what? He doesn't want to put him away in a home and all of this stuff. And it goes back and forth. And then Emmett comes, right? And he comes down and he's like, who are you? What are you, what are you doing in my house? And he's hovering up here. All of this stuff is just masterful, like visual storytelling. But he's like, why the fuck are you in my house? Where's Elizabeth? Elizabeth is his wife who, who died long ago. Elizabeth, call the police. Dad, damn it, I'm your son. And he's like, this is my goddamn house, thieves. And then the little girl, right? Dina, the daughter, the granddaughter runs in. And as she comes in, he's like, get the fuck out. You hear me? I'll kill you. I'll kill you. All of you, right? So this terrible scene. Rumble, here comes the storm. Great dramatic buildup. Janie, I'm sorry. Where are you going, right? And then she's just like, I'm leaving. And you need to come with us or are you staying here? And he's like, please don't. You don't know him. He's a good man, right? And they go on and she's like, we need you. And he's like, it's not fair. He needs me too and all of this. And so she leaves, right? The wife leaves, Janie. You have to let it go. This isn't your home anymore, she says. And then he's like, please, Jenny, don't. And then, of course, he's like, what can we do? The sheriff is like, you know, I can have somebody stay with him for the night. And he's like, no, I'll stay with him. To me, that's perfect characterization, right? Perfect. So let's look at it for a second or unpack it, right? I'll get away from it for a minute. But the thing that's great about it is like clearly you see what Roy's problem is, right? Roy has all these amazing attributes, by the way, and he has a great story, but who he is like in that story for the purposes of the, the tale that Donnie is telling is this incredibly heartfelt and powerful story. Honestly, it's again, it's one of my favorite books of the last few years about how people live on in our memories. And so it's okay to let go when it's time to let go. We live on through the stories that we tell and hold about people we love. Um, and it's, it's done so powerfully. Um, and it's done with huge fun too. There's cosmic gods and monsters and everything in the book. But um, the thing I really love about characterization to stay on topic with this is that Roy is beginning from a place where clearly he's not ready to let go or even make a change to like adjust to admit that his father is as bad as he is, right? That's the how. I mean, that's the, that's the where. That's where he is on his arc. Everything coming is going to challenge that. And Tyler actually pointed out to me when I was telling him how much I love the book, that there's a parallel scene much later on where everything has kind of gone to hell and everything is out on the surface and it's, it's really close to the end of the story. 
And similarly, these gods and stuff are fighting, this god is fighting with Emmett and it's this huge battle. And Janie, the wife says, are you coming with us or not? And he does go at that point. And it's a parallel, a beautiful echo mirror scene where you see where he is at the end of his journey that way too. And the ending scenes of the book will break your heart. It's just great. So my point is the characterization of where is totally crystal clear here, right? It's crystal clear. And it's a great dramatic scene. The how, right? Donnie introduces us with this kind of great colloquial kind of voice that's first person narration at the beginning. And what you learn at the end of the story, not to super spoil it, but it's the descendants of these characters, a descendant of the characters talking um, about how the story was told to them. Um, but the other thing is that uh, the, uh, the, the characterization itself, there's no handholding once it begins, right? So there's nothing, there's, it's all dialogue, it's all drama, even the angles chosen and all of that kind of stuff by um, Jeff in that way are, are, are destabilizing. It feels tense, nothing is comforting. Everything is making you feel the drama and like the, the anxiety that Roy feels in that scene, okay? There's so many ways he could have done it. He could have narrated over it. Well, and Roy felt in this moment, blah, 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 from the same voice. And, and it wouldn't, it's not that it wouldn't work or it would be bad, but it wouldn't be as effective as the choice he made. Because understanding, again, what your story is about and that stuff, key, understanding who your character is, and then applying sort of what your story is, you know, where your character is in the arc, applying sort of all of that stuff to that and understanding how to tell the story given those things is like absolute key. Are there any questions that are popping up, Tyler, that have to do with this? I don't want to go too fast. Uh, well, there's one question from Tito James that I really like where uh, he says that last class, Donnie mentioned uh, that all you need are character wants and obstacles. And he's struggling with defining character wants. So just wondering if you had any suggestions. Oh, sure. I mean, what your character wants sometimes isn't apparent to them until, you know, the story begins, right? So a character can be perfectly happy like Batman in Court of Owls and something forces them out of their comfort zone and they can be a reluctant hero as well. So they don't need to know you don't they don't need to realize what they want at first necessarily in some cases. In other cases, like Moana, or which was just on in my house a second ago, or at like, you know, every so many movies and comics and everything, the character knows immediately what they want, like, you know, Pearl coming into American Vampire, which I just showed you. Um, so it's, it's again, that's a matter of kind of figuring out for you what your story is about, right? Your, your character eventually will come to want something one way or another. Like they can want to not admit the thing that's in their face the whole time of the story and push back against that, which is like a, almost a, a kind of a negative or a, 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 an inverted uh, sort of type of arc, but it still is the same structure. It's the same arc. They'll be pushing back against the thing that's pushing them. What they want in that situation is not to change. <laughs> you know what I mean? They want not for things not to happen. Here, I mean, Roy's, that, this is one of those stories actually, like Roy, his whole goal or what he wants is for his father to be better. And that's an impossibility, right? He wants his father, he wants, his, he wants to, to connect with his father at a time when it's impossible to connect with his father. So you can kind of get to the bottom, even if the way the story is structured makes that a negative thing, meaning it's not something that suddenly he has an opportunity to do. Um, but he's fighting against things, trying to make that worse. Like he's fighting against the idea that, you know, it, your story can be structured that way, but you, you kind of zero in on what your character wants like that. So if they're fighting against, like Batman, what he wants is to know Gotham better than anybody. That's in Court of Owls, right? That's what I mean. So I'm pushing against that and making him come out of his shell. And at a certain point, if your character's wrong like that, or they're doing the wrong thing, they realize they have to come to grips and accept, well, um, that in that case, the only way to be the person that knows Gotham best or to be the best Batman you can is to admit you'll never know anything. I mean, never know everything. You'll know some things, but you know what I mean? You'll never know the city as well as you want. And accepting that and accepting some sense of humility is how Batman's going to be an even better hero. And it takes, it takes a lot to get Bruce to do that. You see what I mean? So it's always wants, what was the other word he used, wants and what? Uh, obstacles. Yeah, right, wants and obstacles. So it's like your character, sometimes the obstacle comes and grabs them is the thing, you know what I mean? Like, but in, in a case that's where the character is super active, 
and want something from Go, like a classic quest, you know, story um, where they leave because they um, are looking for something and all of that. You know, the want is to, to achieve some kind of emotional state and everything you're putting in their way are the obstacles. I mean, like for example, a story like that for me is like zero year. Batman wants to become, Bruce wants to become, that I've done, I mean, you know, Bruce wants to become this incredible hero. And every time he takes a step forward, something says you're not good enough. Something steps in and says, you can't do it. Something says, you know, you don't deserve it in that way. And he has to keep pushing through it. You know what I mean? So think about that when you watch anything on TV, anything, any movie, because Donnie is totally right. And again, like one of the things we don't have time, I'm already like worried about time tonight um, to get into kind of structure and three act structure, but we will with character arcs next, um, next class. And I'll show you how it is. It's like, my character wants this. I put something in their way, you know? My character wants, well, gets past that and thinks in a way that they've achieved. Well, no, guess what? There's something even bigger that was connected to this thing that, you know, you, you saw, you didn't see coming and whatever. And all of that's what a character arc is. It's almost like a character trying to get somewhere or trying to resist something and, and either dragging them this way or putting something in, in front of them plot wise that forces them to you know adapt and change and grow so um for me plot is the thing is the obstacle a lot of the time and the wants and the emotional arc is the thing that's the driving force of all of it so plot is a device a lot of the time to kind of force your character to uh, to raise the stakes and force your character to kind of come to terms with the things that they don't want to come to terms with or you know, up the ante in terms of their beliefs and the thing that they're trying to do. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? I don't know why I asked that. And I'm like, I'm, I don't see any answers. So I ask it and then I'm like looking at my own face being like, I understand what I mean. Um, so I'm gonna jump over. Let me show you one of the best characterizations ever, not in comics, but I just love this so much, this, this character. I just think it's such a perfect, I remember when I saw it when I was like, 18 years old, but it's Cool Hand Luke. And um, here, I'm going over. Is it sharing? It is, right? Yep. Great. So here, it's just, this is the opening, right? The visuals of it too, it's such a comic, it's just so great. What are you doing that fella? I just cut the uh, meat thing. You better come along with us. That's it. That's so I don't know what this thing is coming in, but so just to look at something for a second with that, right? Every decision that was made visually, character wise, to me is like so spot on. Okay. And what it does, we meet Luke, right? There's no narration, there's no anything. It just starts violation in your face. What does that mean? If you're doing a comic, you could easily do that, right? Violation. It's how he feels. Luke is a character in that movie that essentially like hates authority, can't stand like authority for the sake of authority. And 
what he's doing when you back away before you see his face, you realize he's cutting the heads off parking meters, which is totally ridiculous and pointless, right? But he also oddly is tender where he takes the head of the parking meter, puts it on the curb, right? For no, because he doesn't want it to, people to trip over it or cars to hit it. And before he cuts the head off one of them, he kisses it. And he's also so drunk already that he can barely talk and he's still opening another beer and still going at it. So it's all kind of, rebellion for the sake of rebellion against the ridiculous thing. We never even learned what the gripe was that he had with the person that, um, you know, caused him to do this. When they ask him later why he's doing this, he says, just settling an old score. Um, but the idea that he laughs also when the cops come and say, we're taking you away, just who he is. Like, so it's not only like who he is, it's where he is, right? He's at a place where he's never going to, he's doing things that are totally self-destructive because he cannot get out of his own way when it comes to authority, right? So every decision, the violation, and that's the, that's the where he is, right? So where is he? He's completely at a loss when it comes to um, not being able to let go of grudges against things that he feels are ridiculous um, bureaucratic impositions, right? And stop you from being who you wanna be. And then, um, the how is violation in your face makes you feel like it's it's a little shocking it's like I want that out of here and then he cuts it puts it away and then you're watching him just quietly and it kind of is this odd connection you feel even though it's strange because it's just silent and you see him in between all the different things and it feels like they're oppressive so him cutting the heads off feels right and then the laugh and the music makes you like him right away you're like I like that guy I, I want to know I want I'm on his team so everything about that characterization to me is where he is on his arc and the how of how they deliver it is just, again, spot on, right? Okay, let me look at another comic with you. And then um, let's look at Saga. Saga is so great. And I'm so glad it's coming back. And Brian is a friend and I'm really happy for him. And he's also one of the nicest and funniest guys in all of comics, by the way. Um, I was lucky enough to go to the, the best, it was like, we got invited to go to um, Angoulême, which is this beautiful town in France in this like 15, 16th century town. Um, and I'm like, I'm a total, you know, barbarian. I don't know anything about that stuff. And they invited us to stay in this, uh, this old chateau for this Comic-Con. And it was like me, Brian Bond, Fiona Staples, and you know my wife, their their partners, um, Becky Cloonan, Sean Murphy, like Greg. It was just the best group. And I just remember Brian Vaughn and and them like trying desperately to get this humongous fireplace going. It was like six feet big and just throwing like trees in it and everything. And the host coming in and being like, what are you doing? There's like a knob that you just turn it on. You're like, anyway, the Brian is amazing. And I'm I love this book. Um, and it was written about sort of the terrors of parenthood, but set against like this, which, you know, I think a lot of us can relate to, but it's set against this epic war. So if you haven't read it, you know, you, it's more, it's not saying it's worth a read. is like the understatement of the year. Okay. So characterization. The thing about this book also is it's doing a really interesting set of things with characterization. Okay. This is how an idea becomes real goes to narration. And here we meet Alana. And a close up on her face, right? Am I shitting? It feels like I'm shitting. You turn the page and you realize she's giving birth. Just keep pushing, we're so close. And she's like, seriously, you'll never have sex with me again if I defecate all over you, unless you're secretly into that. Please don't be into that. But ideas are fragile things. Most <clears throat> don't live long outside the ether from which they were pulled, kicking and screaming. And he's like, you have never been more beautiful, uh, as beautiful as you are to me right now. And you're looking right at him. So you feel him, who he is, you feel her from seeing her there. You're, you're intimately in the struggle with them, right? Right, because there's nothing more lovely than a fat woman spread eagle on the back of an, uh, uh, on the back of, in the back of an old body shop. It's something right out of a fairy tale. Or, and then she's like, that's why people create with somebody else. And you realize later in this issue, which is the first issue, that their daughter, Hazel, is the one that's narrating the whole story. Um, but, and she's like, oh, holy fuck. And then she's like, oh no, it feels good. Is that terrible? And it feels good. And then she's like, why are you crying? You know, um, what is it, Marco? What is it? And then he's crying and he says, it's a girl. Anyway, this is the day I was born. 
And then you go into the scene here, it's tender, the baby Hazel breastfeeds and they get into this like kind of comical fight where it's first they're tender, like, oh, she has ear horns, she has ear wings and this. And then he bites the umbilical cord and she's like, oh my God, that's so gross, you have a sword. And here you get it. I made a vow, Alana, I'm a father now, not a soldier and this blade is never leaving its scabbard, Oof, right? This, this much gristle, oh, that's your daddy, Pico. And they get into a little thing about whether or not she should have this wing bleeding ceremony and, they, and she jokes, are we having a fight right now? Because that's how we ended up with this one. That characterization to me, is again, it's it's perfect for a number of reasons. And it has an extra layer. It has the layer of Hazel narrating it to you, you know, and above, like when it comes to the entire series, you know, Hazel is, is ultimately gonna be the main character. But I think the reason um, I love that scene so much and when I picked it up, I felt such a connection to it is because the where they are is immediate, right? They're characters at the beginning of a journey of being parents and they don't know what they're doing. And they're clearly like down on their luck and they're like all the odds are against them and all of that stuff. And the intimacy that's expressed between them and the jokiness and all of the kind of like armor down raw vulnerability is there. You know, that's there, them as a team, you know, the, the where they are as kind of um, partners is clear immediately. And there are, they're starting this crazy journey. They have no idea how to get through it. Right, that's that's where they are, and it's lovable from the how, in terms of narrating from Hazel's point of view, and saying this is the day I was born, creates this incredible sort of epic scope where you realize years and years and years of story are ahead of us. And by the time you get to the end of the issue, it doubles down on that, where Hazel says, um, you know, I'm not going to say that I became a great person, but at least I got to become old. Not everybody, and they helped me do that. Not everybody gets to, to say that. And you see these red eyes behind the characters, like the threat that one of them is going to die soon. Um, it's such a beautifully constructed how. It's, it's almost like he's, he's starting them at a certain place in the arc, but he's telling you it's called Saga because it's going to go for so many loops of story because it's Hazel's story ultimately, right? So everything about the how is telling you what the book is, telling you these characters' relation to the story itself. Everything about the where is driving you right in there. You, by the end of the issue, you're really with them. You're with them there. But the next sequence where they're attacked by different sides, like his Marco's family comes to stop them and the, the uh, uh, Baron of um, Prince Robot comes to stop them. And it's this big epic kind of action sequence. But the point is, it's clearly, it's, it, it could start anywhere in the story, but it starts exactly where it should emotionally, where you're with them on the most important moment of their lives, where they're most vulnerable, they're most exposed, they're most who they are, all their hopes are there, all their fears are there, and that's what the book is about. It's about the kind of epic saga of being parents, even though it's set against this wild backdrop of, you know, mysticism, magical, space, cosmic, uh, soap opera. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm past when I said that I was going to stop. I'll take some questions, but again, um, characterization for me, I know I keep saying it, but I just want to like drill it into your head is yes, know who your character is, but know where they are in their emotional journey, where they are in their arc, construct a scene that speaks to that immediately in that way, like, and, and viscerally. And then think about what kind of story you're telling and how they exist in relation to that. Is, it a, is what you're trying to say, this is going to be a massive story. Are you trying to say, like Saga, are you trying to say, I really want him, no, this story is all about this experience with this character and I want you to feel absolutely locked in with them. Well, then maybe you use first person narration, right? Or you say, you know what? This is a story where I want you to be surprised by everything and I want you to feel things with them but not that they know anything that's going on. Well, then maybe you don't use narration at all and you just use or use refractive or whatever, but you use just dialogue and experiential kind of writing to, to get somebody into the story, okay? So that's, that's what I'm saying is it's where they on the arc and then how that determines and um, the, the, not how that determines kind of the scene you construct and then the how of how they relate to the story itself, the story you're trying to tell, okay? Um, all right, so I had other things I was going to show you a scene from, read a look at a scene from Invisible, the opening of Invisible Man by Ellison, which I love and I think is one of the best characterizations and uh, 
it's really interesting because it actually, it starts from the end of the story and then backtracks um, because it's this great buildings Roman, you know, obviously like one of the best books of the, the last, you know, hundred plus years. Um, but uh, it also, oh, let's look at it. Why not? I'll just show you what I'm talking about because it's stupid to talk about it without showing it here. Bang and wait, do I have it here? Oh no, did I not? Oh yeah, I did here. So this is, this is just the opening. Ah, right? I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe. By the way, first of all, that line, I am an invisible man, right? It hooks you right away. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Like the bodiless heads you sometimes, you see sometimes in circus sideshows. It is as though I have been surrounded by mirrors of hard, distorting glass. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. That, I remember reading that in high school and being like, wow, this is an amazing character. And the thing that I've come to learn, having read it a couple times since, is it's also an amazing, it's not only amazing characterization, but it's the where and the how are great too, because where you're starting, you're starting the character in terms of the journey you're telling at the beginning, but in terms of where they're narrating from, they're narrating literally from the end of the story, like after everything happened with a different sense of, um, a different sense of wisdom about and, and perception about things. And they're narrating about a time at which they were naive and the uh, experiences they go through were all transformative and brutally um, uh, evolving for them in all kinds of ways. So the, the idea emotionally and psychologically. So the um, idea of starting in that notes from the underground way here is such an interest. It's a, again, for characterization, you should totally pick it up. But what I want you to realize, the reason I'm showing you something from like a book, showing you a movie, I could do TV, we could look at a million comics. Other comics I was going to show during this, I was going to show Kick-Ass because that's one that um, it starts from, it's really, a, it's a great opening narration and it literally starts, um, or the, the scene from which he's narrating is in the middle of the story. And then, so he's telling you, he missed her ex at the beginning, but he's like, oh, you want to see where I am? This is where I am. I'm, and it's him being shocked by all the bad guys in this terrible position. He's like, but that's the situation now. Let me tell you how I got here. And it goes back. And so where he is in the arc um, is in the middle, even though the story he tells goes back to the beginning. But the reason you do it that way, um, the reason he's doing it that way is to give you, the reader, a sense of kind of um, irreverence. He's trying to say like, I'm in here in this terrible position, but I'm going to take the time to tell you how I got here and so on. And that device um, is, is a really effective way of kind of drawing people in if the how, if the story that you're trying to tell is something that you want to feel, you know, fun and kind of, uh, yeah, exuberant and a little bit rebellious and all of that. If you're like, I did it with We Have Demons. It has that same kind of a feel where you're like, you're narrating from a point in the middle of the story or a few hours into the story and you backtrack and say, how did I get here? I went like this. And then you catch up to it in a fun way. So anyway, I don't have time to show it, but the, the idea is every time you pick up a comic, every time you watch a movie, every time you look at a TV show and think about characterization this way, you know, there, you can think about voice like we did in our first class. You can think about, uh, you can think about um, three act structure, you can, any of the stuff that we've been talking about in any way. But if you think about characterization, please think about it this way. What is the scene I'm watching that introduces this character, this protagonist? How is this indicative of them being um, at a certain point in their emotional arc? And why were these craft decisions made in terms of the how? Why, why is this being used or that being used? Why am I made being um, sort of pulled in through X, Y, or Z, through these techniques? Okay, so again, um, I hope that covers the stuff we didn't get to. Are there a couple questions? I can take a couple questions if people have. Tyler, if there's anything that you see that pertains to the stuff that I was saying that you think is super on point. I have one question that ties a little bit into God Country to go back to that, make it a little full circle. Uh, Connor Stoops Smith 
with stories like metal or more cosmic stories, how do you handle characterization of characters who've lived for centuries or have immense cosmic awareness? How do you make them relatable or understandable without losing that sense of scale? That's a great question. I mean, it really just depends on who they are. You know, I mean, like, like we looked at, um, you know, and who they are and, and where they are again in their arc. So like we looked for a second, I think it's right when Donnie jumped in last class, if I remember correctly, but what we were looking at last time, right before that was Thanos, Thanos wins, right? And Thanos, there couldn't be a bigger, more cosmic and expansive character than him. But the way that Donnie did that was to give this beautiful preamble that was all about the scale of Thanos, right? It was like how every superhero secretly worries that Thanos is gonna win eventually. And then the whole story is about what happens if he does. But um, what makes him relatable is the fact that where Donnie starts him in his emotional arc is that he's bored. He's, he's won so many times that he doesn't feel there's anything left to do and he's frustrated. And then suddenly something comes into his life that says, I'm more powerful than you. And uh, you know, let me take you on a journey that's going to let you win for real like that. So, um, you know, as an example for me, like when I was writing the quintessence or, you know, you're writing cosmic um, uh, Wonder Woman or any of the characters that have this kind of amazing, like the specter, any of that stuff. Um, it's about kind of figuring out how they play in the story. You know, it's, it's not about who they are so much as it's about, again, where they are, if they're the protagonist in their emotional arc, or if it's about, um, you know, their bit players or their second player, secondary characters, it's about creating a role for them that speaks to what the story is about. So that, you know, if Galactus comes in, Galactus isn't just like, I am Galactus. It's about why the character has entered the story and what it's doing for it in that way. It's, it's the purpose of all of it. Do you know what I mean? It's again, it's all dictated by what your story is about. I hope that, I hope that makes sense. What else? Do you see one, Tyler, or me? I'm seeing one from uh, Daniel Vidal Garcia. Have you felt that you've ever messed up a character or changed, uh, changed it to maybe fix an error uh, while writing a story? What do you do when you feel like you've lost the essence of the character while you're writing it? Well, I can't, I mean, to be totally honest, like I haven't, I don't feel like I've really, I feel like there are things I could have done better, but I don't feel like I really missed the essence of the characters on my terms. Meaning I could have completely gotten them wrong on your terms if they're licensed characters that, um, that you know, I have my own take on. I can tell you the one time in my whole career, I feel like I kind of, I kind of was thinking of what I thought would be a fun almost take on a licensed character that, I almost like kind of feel like maybe I was young and and when we did the new 52, they were very much about giving every character and villain new origins. And um, they were playing around with Mr. Freeze and there was a kind of sense that he was too sympathetic. And they were like, does anyone have a way of making him or is there a way of making him kind of scarier and new? And I had, the, I got really, I always had this idea in the back of my head, not that I wanted to make it canon, but I always wanted to do a story where you realize in some way, whether it was fan fiction or, you know, all else worlds that, um, that, uh, that Nora is not somebody he knew, but Nora is kind of somebody he has fantasized about because she represents in some ways, the things he loves about the cold, even if he doesn't want to admit that to himself. And so I did a story that was sort of a, a kind of, at Batman Annual, or I, I was part of James and I co-wrote it, um, and it was uh, it was about Mister Free realizing that Nora in the New Fifty Two for Mister Freeze was the first person that was ever cryogenically frozen, and he's kind of invented this relationship in his head with her that she's his love because she's embraced the cold in a way that he loves the cold. And I do love that idea. Don't get me wrong, but it was the only time at my tenure at DC where I felt like we had been a little cavalier with, um, with character, with character stuff that I, um, again, like that was the spirit of the new 52. It was sort of like, let's try things. It was the one time I kind of tried something in a way that I think I, I maybe went farther than in my own sort of comfort zone and my own like compass. I think I, I went a little bit outside of it, 
Um, so we people we got we got a lot of good response for that story, and some people that were very mad about it too. But it's the only I don't that never bothers me. It's it's the it's the only time I feel like maybe I kind of gave into some of the stuff that the new fifty two wanted, um, and it wasn't bad things they wanted. It was just that that one I feel like maybe I um maybe th that's the only one I look at and I'm like, should I, should I have done that? But again, it got retconned and it's all back to Nora. And I, I, I did it too. Like I went back and, and made Nora who she is in one of my stories and all-star and all that stuff too. So um, I retconned my own story, but uh, I don't know. I'm dwelling on it, but that's, that really is like the one time in my time at DC that I remember doing something and being like, did I, did I screw that up? So Oh, not that I, I all the time, all day to myself, am I like, did I screw that up when it comes to my story? But when it comes to like having done something that betrayed my own sensibilities that way, that's the only time I can think of playing with a licensed character that I'm not sure. That's one issue. So I think I, I'm, 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 I'm lucky in that way. What else, Tyler? Actually, that might be a good place to call. It's been about an hour of the full class. What do you think? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So again, thank you guys so much for coming by. Um, I love doing this. I hope that you'll, you'll show up for um, the, the, the next one towards the end of this month with Chip. We'll have a blast. We're going to talk big picture. We're going to talk character arcs, how to construct them. He's going to choose a couple of things that I'm going to ask you guys to read. I'll give them to you so you don't have to buy them and that stuff. And um, uh, I'll give you some of my stuff. Like, again, I think the easiest stuff to, to look at is, is Court of Owls or that stuff or, or um, um, maybe something else. I don't know. But um, anyway, the point is um, we'll have a blast. And uh, thank you guys so much for doing this. I really, I really appreciate it.